The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. What I want to do today is to uh, build on, build on what we have, uh, the movie and the discussion we had last time. So I think in the uh, in the movie, a lot of teams appear that are also in the in the chapter on health. If you've read it, a lot of the teams are kind of there, but in sort of some <coughs> random way. And in the discussion we have had, we also have uh, elaborated on those teams. But now what I want to do is to try and put them all together in a kind of coherent frame, give you a bit more of uh, specific examples that, that are in the book uh, specifically. So, and we've been, of course, going to be talking about, about health in particular with the angle of uh, uh, how people choose which healthcare to access, how people choose what doctors to see for what, <coughs> why people are not doing more preventive care in investments and things like that. Obviously, we are not doctors, so we are not talking about health from the point of view of what could treat people. We are taking this as given and then wonder how do we get this uh, stuff that can treat people out there in a, in a large scale. So we start with these things. There are some technologies that are uh, known that have been demonstrated in randomized trials to be uh, effective and cheap ways to promote good health. Uh, so some examples of that include uh, bed nets to prevent malaria, uh, which uh, include immunization, which is, you know, costs a maximum of, you know, maybe 15 to 20 dollars per child and is one of the cheapest way to prevent uh, child death. Breastfeeding, which of course is free uh, and uh, is recommended by WHO to be done from one hour after birth until six months, at least in places where the water is not very clean. Um, oral re rehydration solution, which is uh, uh, basically a mix of sugar and, and salt that you put in water when the kid comes with, uh, with, a lot, with acute diarrhea. That's not going to cure whatever caused the diarrhea, but it's going to prevent dehydration, which is the main reason why people die of diarrhea. And uh, bleach, you know, chlorine that you put in your water. So these are just a few examples of things that have been demonstrated to be effective and cost effective and cheap and accessible. And one of the major puzzle and frustration uh, that we see in global health is that these investments are just not really, don't really reach people or are not really undertaken by people. Uh, and so the question is why? So it's certainly not because they are not useful, they save lives, uh, even if they don't. So you could argue that what's the value of a life? Maybe it's not so much worth it, but the value of a life would have been very, very low for these things not to be worth it. But even if you leave that behind, uh, conditional on surviving, you're going to do much better if, you've been, if you have not been very sick in all, of, all through your childhood. So we've seen that for deworming, We've seen that if kids were dewormed when they were children, they were not sick with worms, they are making 23% more every year, which turns to be like a fantastically good rate of return. We are talking about, about a, maybe $1,400 in current dollars at the, uh, <laughs> over a child's lifetime for an investment of less than a dollar. And the same argument that uh, malaria also makes countries poor and people poor has been made, uh, has been made for malaria by Jeff Sachs. And uh, Sachs and, and Gallup, uh, who was also a researcher at, the, at Harvard at the time when Sachs was at the time, found that uh, if you control for other factors, malaria countries, so countries where malaria is prevalent, have a GDP that is 30% lower than non-malaria countries. And what are the other factors? They are like geography, latitude, the climate, things like that. You can actually see it on a map. This is a, a, a map from Gallup and Sachs where you're showing, uh, where it shows where malaria is prevalent. 
at least where it was in 1965. And you can see that there is a, there, there is a fair amount of, of luck that is involved in, or bad luck that is involved with malaria. If you're in between the tropics, you're just much more likely to, to be infected with malaria simply because this is the environment where uh, the mosquitoes that carry the malaria thrive. So there used to be um, uh, a lot of malaria in Latin America. There used to be malaria in the American South once upon a time, uh, which is just above the, the, somewhat above the tropic, but otherwise most of the malaria is in Africa, Latin America, India, uh, and, and uh, uh, Southeast Asia. So this is, keep, this, keep this, this figure in mind, like this is where malaria is important. And now if we look at GDP in 1994, oh no, sorry, that's malaria in 1994. It got better in, uh, in Latin America, it didn't get much better in Africa, it got worse in India. And this is GDP per capita in 1995. And you can see that you have a nice, or not nice, but striking reversal of the colors which is the countries that are very dark in the malaria picture are now very light in the GDP per capita picture. So this uh, results that he found in the regression that, you know, adding statistical bells and whistles is just um, translation of that picture that basically the dark country in the malaria picture are the light country in the GDP picture. So that's, there's no doubt about this fact. Now, does this necessarily mean that, so on the basis, this article was very influential, it was published in 2001, was very influential to kind of bring a push for the fight against malaria as an economic type of uh, intervention that, that, uh, that has a decent rate of return that we should do, not for compassion, compassion value, but for economic purpose, uh, fight malaria with bed nets and things like that. Now, some people obviously objected to that, saying, well, that's not necessarily a proof that malaria causes the low GDP. And what else could be going on? What else did they argue was going on? Exactly. It could be that it takes some money to fight malaria. In fact, that's exactly what Sachs is arguing, that it takes some money to fight malaria, so we need to help the poor country. And in fact, when you look at the countries that got malaria in 1965 and don't get it in 94, or if you look at the countries that had little of malaria in 65 and have a lot in 94, you see some kind of striking pattern, for example. Basically, it mostly disappeared, not entirely, but mostly disappeared in Latin America between 1965 and 1994. And nothing happened in most of <coughs> Africa. In India, it actually increased between 1965 and 1994, uh, but the same increase didn't happen in Sri Lanka, which is the little dot that is next to India on the map here. So why is it the case that given the similar geographic circumstances in the sense Latin America managed to get rid of malaria but not Africa, why is it the case that malaria increased in India in the same time it reduced in Sri Lanka? That's not entirely explained by geography. In fact, for the most part, it's not explained by geography. It is explained by the fact that in Latin America there have been very uh, sustained large effort to fight malaria that we are going to, to talk about uh, in a moment they just basically sprayed extremely aggressively with DDT. They drained the swamps. They did all sorts of things like that, which managed to control malaria. And they managed to do it. And the same thing happened in Sri Lanka. So if you compare Sri Lanka and, and Sri Lanka, for example, and Tamil Nadu, which is the part of India that just faces Sri Lanka, for the most part has the same people. At least part of Sri Lanka is Tamil, even though they are not very pleased to be there. The relationship. So in Sri Lanka, you, man, you had like very aggressive control of malaria and pretty much a disappearance of malaria. In the meantime, in Tamil Nadu, right next door with a similar climate, you get, you get, if anything, an increase of malaria. And so this is not due to geography or anything. This is due to politics and your ability to organize your people and to organize your country and to get something done. And so it is likely to be the case that if you're able to get something done to control malaria, you're just able to get something done in general. So if, and if you're not able to get something done with malaria, you're not able to get something done in general. 
So maybe the same countries, and this is certainly true uh, for Sri Lanka, that at the same time they manage to control malaria. They are also extremely effective in getting out preventive care for their people, immunization for their people, uh, preschools and things like that. So from Sri Lanka has a lot of political problems, but from the point of view of uh, uh, a country that delivers social services to their country, it's actually quite effective. So it's certainly the same countries that have managed to control Maria have managed to do other good things, and maybe this is why they are richer in 1995. So on its own, this correlation is certainly not sufficient to tell us that there is a cause. So before moving further, I want to give you I want to be able to answer this question, which is, we know that the malarial countries are 30% poorer than the non-malarial country. To what extent can, this be, is this, can we say it is due to malaria? And to what extent is this uh, the reverse co uh, causality that the countries that were good at controlling malaria also uh, managed to do other good things? And we can... Uh, answer this question by looking at, uh, precisely by looking at those episodes where malaria was eradicated. Because malaria was eradicated by very clear, specific action that was taken at some point in, the, in those countries. And there are, se there are a series of papers, uh, one on the Americas, which is the one we are going to study now, one on uh, uh, the, what is called the malarial periphery, so that's Paragu Paraguay, Sri Lanka, and one on India, that looks at those eradication campaigns and tries to look at what is the impact for a child of having been born in a ma place that used to be malarial after the er eradication campaign rather than before. So let's look at the a very nice study that is the, um, the study uh, about Latin America. So it's a study by a researcher in Chicago called Hoyt Blakely. And what he looks at is uh, DDT, DDT spraying. It's also interesting because actually the question of DDT spraying is a pretty controversial one today because it's now pretty much forbidden anywhere to spray anything with DDT because it's not very good for you to to eat food that has been sprayed with DDT. On the other hand, maybe it's n also not very good for you to get malaria. <laughs> so there is a little bit of a conflict between those two objectives, with a lot of people saying we should go back to DDT, and a lot of pe people saying no. For example, there is a huge political fight in Uganda between the organic farmers and the rest of the country, essentially. The organic farmers don't want any DDT anywhere near their crop, obviously because in that case, that will, the European community would put a stop on, uh, uh, on, on, their, ex on their export towards the European Union. And so the, the, any effort of eradicating malaria with spraying of DDT has been stopped in Uganda. But at the time, they were not so worried about that. So the comp there was a big eradication campaign uh, in Latin America that started around 1955, partly with international funding. And so they sprayed everywhere, and they made sure to try and get rid of malaria everywhere. They even sprayed under people's uh, roofs, like uh, in, the, in the eaves of a, of a house, the mosquitoes nest under the roof. So they went there and put the DDT there, uh, which is probably not excellent for people's health directly, but it's very bad for the mosquitoes for sure. So uh, what they look at is, so what the study, the Blackley study does, is to exploit the fact that if you started in a region where there were not so much malaria to start with, then the decline in malaria was lower. So here is one example for uh, Colombia. So this is uh, cases of malaria in Colombia by year. So you can see that in 1950, you had a lot of malaria cases every year. The campaign started roughly in, at the, in 1955. Intensive spraying started uh, in 1958 and you start getting a huge drop in the cases of malaria countrywide. So it's pretty effective. Basically, you go from 60, 600 cases, I think it's a month, to about nothing, to close to nothing. And that happened in a very short period of time. So you could look at people born around those times, but of course, other things happen over time, so we don't really want to do that only. 
But what you can do then is to say, well, now let's look at regions that got more malaria before uh, the campaign. And this is the reduction in the number of malaria cases in those regions. And of course, the more malaria you got, the bigger the reduction. Because the reduction was pretty much to zero. So if you started with 100, you get about a 100% reduction, like in this place, Choco. If you started with no malaria at all, then you get no reduction because there was nowhere to go. It's a little bit like the, um, the anemia paper that we saw before. If you started anemic, then getting the pill makes you non-anemic. But if you are non-anemic, you don't benefit. Same thing here. So this graph is by region. So these are all different regions, Choco, Cauca, Narino, Santander. These are all regions. And you can see that the, the, the regions that got that had a lot of malaria before the eradication got the biggest reduction between the post-campaign to the pre-campaign. So this is the reduction in cases, and this is where you started from. So now what he's going to look at is, is it the case, take a child who was born uh, before the, and who was still a child before the eradication campaign started, and take a child who was born after the eradication campaign. So when the child was born, so take a child who was, let's say, 10 by 1960, and a child who is born in 1962. Then the child who is born, who is 10 by 1960, doesn't benefit from the campaign whatsoever. But the child who was born in 1962, by the time he's born, malaria is history. So those, the, the, the young child, relative to the old child, would benefit more in a region where malaria was a big problem than in a region was it, when it was a small problem. So what he is going to do next is to put on the y-axis here, not the reduction in malaria cases, but how much these people make as adults. How much a child uh, born after the campaign makes relative to a child born before the campaign. What is this difference in income between this? And is the difference in income related to the, uh, the malaria at the beginning? So this is called a difference in difference because you're looking at whether the difference in earning between a young and an old cohort is different in places that start from a higher level. So what you are assuming when you're doing that is that there are no other factors that are changing exactly at the same time in the same way, and we're going to see what we can say about that. So here is this graph that I was talking about for Brazil now. So this is the pre-campaign malaria intensity don't worry about the axis, it's sort of standardized at zero. Uh, so for zero being the, like the median case. And this is the income change of those born in 1960, that is those who were born after the campaign, minus those who were born in 1953. It is their income later. We measure the income much later in 1980, for example. So in 1980, we measure the income of those born in 1960, minus the income born of those in 1953, this is all in log. So it's log income in 1960 minus log income in 1953. And what we see is exactly what we would expect if malaria does make you poorer, which is the people who were born in places like uh, Mato Grosso here, where malaria had been a huge deal beforehand, the young people experience a bigger increase in earnings relative to the old people. Then people say in Baia, where uh, uh, malaria was not a big deal to start with. Do you understand this graph? So now we could be worried and say, so you could say, so I'm arguing that nothing else changed between this cohort in a way that's related with malaria intensity. And what could you argue back to me? What is the worry with that assumption? Yeah, so the worry is something else might happen over time, no? I was going to say uh, it's sort of similarly that there's probably a, a third external factor that's both raising income and decreasing malaria at the same time since it has the same effects. It's not necessarily that they're affecting one another, but there's a third thing that's affecting both of them. Right, so it could be something affecting both of them. So Brazil is just becoming generally richer over time. But 
this should be something that is affecting disproportionately Mato Grosso than Bayer, right? Because here I'm not looking only at, I'm not only telling you that income increases between these two cohorts, but I'm also telling you that it increases faster in the region that had more malaria to start with. But you could ask me, for example, is it the case that this place was poorer in the beginning, so they had more places to go as Brazil was becoming richer, the poorer region were catching up with the older region, and this is what I see here, just a catch up. So that could be, it's kind of one twist to the point that both of you made, which is as Brazil was growing, maybe it is possible that this region would have been growing more anyway. Now, of course, I'm looking at the income in 1980s, but these are different cohorts. So these places, maybe the same places that had a lot of malaria, had people who were not very well educated. And at the same time that I took care of malaria, I also built a lot of schools for them. And I'm seeing that these guys' uh, income increase relative to the older ones. It's just because I also built a lot of schools in Mato Grosso. So that would be your third factor that would be differentially important in the region. So that is obviously a real concern by looking at changes in income over the importance of malaria at the beginning, we've gone one step towards some credibility. And we're still very far from our <laughs> randomized trial, which would involve randomly treating some people for malaria, waiting 20 years and seeing how much more money they make, like they did with the deworming. Such study doesn't exist, so we, are going to, we need to try to do the best with what we have. So one way to verify this is that we actually know exactly when people start tre getting treated for malaria, for malaria. Because the campaign, if you go back to this graph, the campaign was quite sudden. So we exactly, in fact, we know the date at which they started spraying. And so we, have an, we should have a pretty clear idea of who, which cohort get exposed and which cohort are not exposed. So instead of doing this kind of graph for a broad cohort and looking at the slope here, I could say, Oh, well, let me do a test. For example, if I did the same graph for those born in 1953 versus those born in 1950, uh, if this graph was due to malaria, why to the decline of malaria, what would I expect if I, instead of doing these differences, I did 1953 minus 1950? What should I, explain, what should I expect for my line? if the only reason why I have a, an increasing line here is due to the reduction in malaria. Yeah? I should expect a flat line, exactly, because the 1953 kids are exposed to malaria, so are the 1950. So the differences between their income should not be related to how much malaria there is, because no one benefited. Now, if instead I'm taking kids who were born in 19... 50, and I'm comparing, so in, so in 1970, and I'm comparing them to the, the wages of kids born in 1965. <coughs> uh, what should I expect for this line? Now I'm looking at very young kids, kids born in 1970 uh, uh, versus 1965. So we can go back to this graph here. What's the, what's the pattern in malaria, era, malaria cases after 1970? Yeah, there is no further decline because there is no malaria left. Yeah. It, should be, it should be flat as well, right? Exactly, it should be flat as well. Not because everybody has malaria, but because no one has malaria. So with malaria, I have a pretty specific pattern as to when I should start seeing an effect. If I'm thinking that the big problem of malaria is when you are very small kids. Then I should start seeing a difference for the, between the children who were born just before and just after the, 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 the campaign. During the time of the campaign scale up, I should see this effect being larger and larger. But for the young cohort, it should flatten out. If I compare very young cohort to somewhat younger cohort, but all of them got exposed. And for the old cohort, it should again flatten out. Uh, because the old call have not yet been exposed. So I can now say something more specific than, well, generally, the very young versus the young are uh, the difference increase in pre-malaria intensity, which could well be correlated with other things happening at the same time. So doing that, and 
So let me guide you to this graph. What is this graph? So it has the shape that I talked to you about, right? It has a shape of being flat and then increasing and then being flat again. So what is this graph? Each of these points is the slope of a regression of this kind. Except that instead of being 1916 versus 1953, it is one year versus the other. So for example, uh, this is every one regard relative to uh, 19, relative to, uh, relative, to the relative to the oldest cohort. So each dot indicates the strength of the relationship between pre-malaria index and the malaria and the index for this par particular cohort. So for example, 19, 1900 versus 1910, 1911, 1912, etc. I'm taking the difference between the income of the cohort born, say, 1910 minus 1900. And I'm regressing, I'm, I'm plotting this graph that is here. Uh, as a function of the pre-malaria intensity, okay? So each of these points here is a slope of a graph that is this graph with, instead of 1960 minus 1953, is, say, 1901 versus 1900, 1902 versus 1900, 1903 versus 1900, etc. And this is plotted as a function of the of the... 1901, 1902, 1903, etc., the cohort of birth. So all of these cohorts were cohorts that were not exposed. And we basically see no differences in, we see no, we see not much of a, of a, of a line. This, is, this line is superimposed, but if you see this, this cloud of dot, the cloud of dot is not increasing. So the difference is not related to uh, the malaria intensity in those places. Those places are generally uh, poorer, but it's not correlated with the malaria intensity. For the younger cohort, we see the slope keeps increasing. The slope keeps increasing, keeps increasing, keeps increasing, until there is basically no difference between a region that got a lot of, that, got, that initially had a lot of malaria and a region that didn't have a lot of malaria, and then it flattens again. So this is the pattern that we were expecting to see, where the old cohort, uh, for the, between the old cohort and the slightly less old cohort, we see no difference until they get exposed to the malaria, and then it, and then it increases and then it flattens again. So you could still have the type of factors that you guys were talking about, that maybe they were building schools exactly at the same time, etc. <coughs> but it would have to be relatively tricky to follow exactly that pattern, where uh, this is the pattern of the, the malaria growing, the malaria campaign growing and growing and growing. And we follow, we have the point pretty much following the expansion of the malaria campaign. So this gives you, this is not complete, you know, you still have to believe that this is the only thing that happens. But it gives you a pretty good sense that it must have been the only thing that really happened for this, because otherwise, like, why would that, would it have this bizarre looking snake shape? So when we look at it, so are you all okay with this graph? And do you find, do you find it reasonably convincing? <coughs> yes, no? No vote. Well, I find it reasonably convincing. And I'm in the business of doing randomized evaluation, so I'm very skeptical of anything that might uh, be a substitute to what I do. But it's hard to imagine another factor that would follow s so nicely uh, the, the pattern of the campaign. So what it does then is to uh, run a regression, which is based on this idea. And it, it concludes that a child uh, exposed to malaria in childhood would have an income that's 50% lower than a child who would not been exposed in childhood uh, over their lifetime. So it's even better than deworming, which is not surprising because malaria makes you sicker than the worms. But this is a, pretty, this is a very large effect. Uh, it's, so it's high, but it's not absurdly high. If you consider that deworming is 23%, we are still in the kind of the ballpark of where it makes sense. So it suggests that childhood malaria actually makes you weak for the rest of your life. And again, we could calculate what it means for the lifetime of someone, of an income. So if, the, if an increase of 23% of income with deworming made you 
about, I think we had found uh, $1,100 richer or $1,300 richer. This is about twice that over your lifetime. So if, if these effects are the same in Kenya, it would mean that avoiding malaria in childhood would make you $2,600 uh, richer for your lifetime, which brings the, brings the question that uh, Zachary had asked at the end of, la of the deworming lecture, which is, if that's so great, why aren't people doing it? And the, so the question here becomes, why aren't countries doing it? And why are people not doing it? So why aren't countries all doing things like Latin America did of intensive campaign to try and get rid of the affliction, so public health kind of measure? And if they're not going to do it because they don't have the funds or because they, there is political economic consideration that prevents DDT from being used or anything like that, then why aren't people at least buying a bed net which costs, you know, $7 or maybe $10 for a family, and it would mean the child would have a pretty good chance of being uh, substantially richer over their lifetime. So that's kind of the mystery. One thing, just to close the loop on, uh, on SACS, is now that you have this estimate, you can, imagine, you can calculate what is, the import, what is malaria prevalence in the countries that have a lot of malaria, how much more these people would make if they didn't have malaria, and obtain a number that is comparable to the 30% differences that is in the Sachs and Gallup article. And what you find is a number that is much, much smaller. So you still find that Sachs and Gallup completely overestimate the impact of malaria on GDP, even though the impact is still on income is still positive and still quite serious. So you do find it's not 30%. It's a number that I don't want to give you the number, and then it happens not to be the right one. But the order of magnitude is maybe a fourth. But it's still pretty significant and important. So that gives us this idea of like why aren't people, why aren't countries praying or why aren't people buying bed nets? And that's kind of this question we could ask over and over and over again. I haven't seen a, a cost benefit uh, analysis of not getting um, diarrhea all the time when you're, in, when you're a child, or be, but that presumably that's something probably similar to the deworming effect because deworming is kind of a, worms are a little bit the equivalent of diarrhea in, in terms of getting rid of your nutrition. So why aren't people putting bleach in their water? Why aren't people, uh, uh, why aren't people buying ORS when they're sick and things like that? So this is the, the mystery we have to ask. So what we have already seen in the previous lecture and also a little bit with nutrition is that preventive care is characterized by two things. One is it has very low demand. And the second is, uh, it is a high sensitivity to prices. So let me show a, a graph. This is the high sensitivity to positive prices. And I'm go going to show you in a moment the high sensitivity to negative prices, which are incentives. So you've already seen some of these numbers. You've already seen the, 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 the yellow, the, the red, the red dots, which are coming from the DUPA experiment in Kenya. So this is this one. Well, we had seen a graph where, so this is, this is the graph for bed nets. So when bed nets are free, you pretty much get them. Uh, but when you, need to, when you need to pay for them, <coughs> you are uh, a little bit of money, like uh, 60 cents, you're less likely to get them, uh, to, to get and use them, et cetera. Uh, what is interesting is that we find the same kind of slope, even steeper, for other goods that are completely different. So you find the same kind of slope for chlorine in Zambia, where if you ask people to pay a little bit for chlorine, they're much less likely to get it. So when they start to have to pay 10 cents, 20 cents, 30 cents, uh, you get, you know, the take up of uh, reduces a lot. You're finding the same thing for uh, deworming in Kenya. You actually briefly evoked this when we were talking about deworming, where we saw that people are uh, people in the school where we did where they did the experiment. At some point, the NGO who was into the sustainability kind of uh, mood, I guess, decided, oh, it makes sense to ask people to pay a little bit for the for the for the deworming. So they asked people to pay a little bit. And basically what happened is that the take-up went essentially to, to zero. But let me try and get it, get the right point. I think this is this one. 
uh, the take up went essentially to zero when people had to pay just a little bit for dewarming. So you're looking at bed net, you're looking at chlorine, you're looking at uh, uh, dewarming. They are all very different products, presumably with very different lifetime benefit. And they pretty much all seem to be on the same slope, which is as soon as people have to pay just a little bit, they don't do it anymore. So that's on the negative price, yeah. Are some rates cheaper because people don't see the value as much in paying for the other things that come Yeah, so what is interesting is that, except for this one, all of the lines are pretty steep. And, uh, and one, so the, the question that we have to ask here is, why is that? And one possible reason wh would clearly be that people don't see the value. We're going to get to that in a moment. Before we go to that, let's see the elasticity with respect to negative price, which are small incentives. So one thing that we already noticed is that uh, people, uh, the rate of immunization is very, very low uh, in some places. It's higher in some others. So this is Udaipur, the places where you saw the movie. So after the movie was finished, one thing we noticed is that a big problem seems to be that kids are not immunized. The immunization rate was very, very, very low, like less than 5%. So we decided to try two things. Uh, the first thing was that the NGO Seva Mandir would work with the government to do a camp, monthly camp for immunization. So every month, they would take the vaccines from the government, go to the village, and immunize whoever was wanted to come to be immunized. And on top of this, uh, we also, Sevamandi also instituted a small incentive to get immunized. So that's a kilo of lentil. So a kilo of lentil, lentil is a staple. Uh, uh, it's, it's something people eat like with, as a source of protein. And a kilo of lentil is about half the minimum wage. So, this is a small, small gift to, to go with it. It's not like a large inducement that if it's something you don't want to do, it would convince you to do it. And these were the, the results. There was also a set of control villages that I'm not showing to you. I'm just showing to you the effect of the incentive. So comparing the camp with and without incentive uh, to the camp uh, with, uh, 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 so the camp without incentive to the camp with incentive. Uh, intervention B are the, 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 the villages where the lentils were put in place. And you can see that pretty much everyone gets the first shot. That's BCG. And the second shot is also pretty similar. From the third, we start seeing a difference. And from the fourth, an even bigger difference. <coughs> and from the fifth, the biggest difference. So the biggest difference is, the, uh, is between so the, the more immunization you need to get, the more the small incentive matter. So it seems that people are not adverse to getting immunized, but they sort of lose interest or something, such that uh, the more you get into trying to get them to complete the course, the more the, the more the incentive is needed. So you get, and this is a reasonably large effect. It's uh, overall, if you look at the effect on immunization, about 12% of kids who have who are in the in the uh, in one intervention, received all the immunization they should get, versus, sorry, 18% <coughs> versus 38% if they, are, uh, if they get the incentive. So we have two things together. One is we have, uh, or three things that we need to try and square. One is the benefits are very high. Two is the demand is very low. And three is the price elasticity is very high, both on the positive side and on the negative side. And the question is, how do we put all of these elements together? And the reason why it is surprising is that, so suppose we take as given that the benefits are indeed very high. In that case, if, the, if, the, if people knew it, if people don't do something, it must mean that they think that the cost is also very high. So why would they think the cost is very high? Maybe they think it's not culturally appropriate. Maybe they hate to do to, to, to get their kids immunized, maybe they maybe sleeping under the bed nest is extremely unpleasant, or maybe they need the money so much. So if people are very sensitive to the benefits, it, it are very aware of the benefits, the only reason why they wouldn't do it is because they think the costs are huge. So for example, another interesting, another fact that we see both in rich and poor countries, people are not very likely to get a test for HIV, <coughs> even if they are, even and maybe particularly, if they have put themselves at risk of HIV. 
And one of the reasons that people say is that people realize that it's, it would be good to know your status, but they are worried. There is a fear of what will you do if you find out that you're positive. Or there is also the social factors of people getting, uh, people knowing that if you go to get tested, it means you have done something that is likely to, you know, you've done something not right. Otherwise, why would you have HIV if you are only faithful to your husband who, husband who is faithful to you? So this is an example where the benefits are high and maybe the costs are also high. But what is surprising is that if people don't do these things because the, the costs are high, then I should not be able to bribe them to do these things with a small incentive like the, a kilo of lentil. If people know the benefits of immunization but don't do it because they think that the AV lie is going to be on the kid, then a kilo of lentil shouldn't convince them that no, the AV lie is going to be good after all. <laughs> it's something it just doesn't square together. Or if the uh, people who are so much aware of the benefit, they shouldn't take a bed net when it's free but refuse to, pen, to spend a few cents for it. So we can't have both these three things be true at the same time. That people realize that the benefits are very high, the demand is very low, and the price elasticity is very high. So it has to be that the benefit viewed from the people is actually not as high as we think they are. And there could be two reasons for that, or three reasons. One is that maybe people don't care about their health or don't care about the health of their children. And that we have already sort of ruled out. Because we've seen in the movie that people are extremely concerned about their health. They spend a lot of money on it. In Udaipo, for example, they spend 7% of their monthly budget on health. That's a lot. And that is something that we've seen in the first lecture. Uh, people do, uh, do spend like up to 5%, 5 to 7% of their budget on health, the very poor, except in countries like Mexico, where there is a good public health system. So it is not that people don't care about health when their kids, we have seen the example of measles. If they, are, they don't ex vaccinate their kids against measles, but if the kids do get measles, they spend a lot of money on their hospital and on treatment. So that's not because they don't care about health. Also, when, they are, when you ask them about what stress, stress, stresses them out, uh, they tend to say that health is the one thing that stresses them out the most. What makes them worried, tense, and anxious in the last month is their health or the health of their, their kids or the health of their relatives. So people do care about the health, and they spend money, but they don't spend it on curative care. They do spend it on curative care, not preventive. And they not only spend, spend it on curative care, but on pretty bad ones. We've seen these like shots and drips and stuff like that. So we can remove this. So now, why don't people don't, preve don't use preventive care? It's not because they don't care about health, but it's because there's something about preventive care that either they, they don't really believe that it works or there is something else that the perception of the benefits from today is relatively low. So our government to blame for that, another possible interpretation is that people are uh, uh, not getting those, those services because they are not generally available. People don't even know that they exist. So, and We've seen in the movie that, to a certain extent, we have reasons to, be, uh, to, to, to blame the government. Nurses are often absent, not only in India, but everywhere. There was a World Bank, country conduct, a World Bank survey conducted in several countries going to the little hospitals where the nurses are. Found 35% of them absent. And even when they're there, they don't really spend a lot of time on people. They don't treat them very well. Uh, there is this... Uh, um, uh, interesting three, three, three rule that uh, Dishnu Das and Jeff Hammer found in, in India. That's uh, three minutes, three questions, three drugs. Mm -hmm. So that's what you get when you go to, a, to see a, a, a doctor in a public health facility. Uh, they interview you three minutes, they ask three questions, they usually don't touch you. They ask you, what do you have? Uh, and then they give you three medicines that you go away with. So that's not excellent care. Uh, and this is not, the doctor, the government doctors usually know much better, know more than the private doctors who are not really qualified. They're all much more qualified. If you ask them to rank uh, vignettes, so you, you, you show them a, a scenario of uh, a child comes to the clinic with a diarrhea and you ask them to ask the right question to evaluate what is this kid suffering from, what should I do? Uh, the public doctors do much better than the private doctors on those, on those tests. 
for example, when a pregnant woman arrives with preeclampsia, which is a potentially fatal condition that happens during, uh, during a pregnancy, <coughs> they are much more likely to diagnose that it's that and to say that the right course of action is to send them to hospital. So in principle, they know more, the public doctors, but in practice, they do much less. So even though they know what they're supposed to do, when you actually look at what they do by putting someone to observe their behavior, you realize that they don't really use their, uh, their, uh, their, their, uh, their knowledge. So that's a part of the problem. The nurses are not here, they are desultory, they don't really care. But it's not the entire problem because if you go back to the immunization uh, experiment that I just showed you, where the first treatment was to have perfect immunization camps. Every month, in your own village, with a para worker that used to go to people and try to remind them that the camp is coming and you should bring your kids and, and the, the, the people who were, the nurses who injected, who were uh, vaccinating the kids were like good, uh, caring, etc. people. Even when you do all that, the only 18% of people or 12% of people got immunized. So that's not the, I think that's actually 18, it's 6 plus 12, 18% of people got immunized. So that's not, so the, the, the bad services by the government doctor is not the only thing that there is to blame because even when you provide good services, you still don't get, uh, uh, don't get a lot of demand. So that's not, so supply is not the only reason, governments are not only to blame. So what are we left with? So people don't demand preventive care, not because they don't care about health, uh, not because it's just not available, because they don't demand it even when it's available. Uh, so we are left with two possible explanations. One is that they, they understand the benefits, but the benefits are far away in the future, and they discount those benefits that are far away in the future a lot. And the second is that uh, they don't know the effectiveness of preventive care just because it's very difficult to learn, to understand what works and why it works and why it doesn't work. Steve. Well, India saw that like, part of the reason was also because they like, believed in religious cures more. Is that true in other countries in the developing world as well? Or is that predominantly? Uh, no, I think it's true in general that people construct all sorts of interesting beliefs. What is important is that you have those beliefs. On the other hand, if I give you a kilo of lentils, those beliefs are not strong enough for you not to uh, sell them for a kilo of lentils. So I think what is really important is that it's not that people think that immunization is something bad, because otherwise it would be very hard to convince them with small things. It has to be that they, don't, they just don't think much about it one way or the other. Yeah. I was Maybe if people are embarrassed, if it has put other people on so something that they usually get the lentils, they can make the excuse of saying, I didn't do it for the first time. Yes, so that is a very interesting question. So for HIV, you could say, uh, well, if that's, if it, it could be that there is a, a if you have a cultural reason not to do something, if I give you, if you have this social reason that you're embarrassed, if I give you a small incentive, you can just say, oh, I'm, I've gone for the small incentive. And in fact, there was a very interesting study that was done, which was trying to shed some light on exactly these issues. So it's a study where, uh, as part of a survey, everyone got tested for HIV, but everyone who agreed. But you didn't need to get your results. If you wanted your results, you had to go pick them up three weeks later at, uh, at uh, camp. And so uh, at the end, uh, people threw a, a bottle cap where they got uh, a reward for picking up their, their tests. So it could go from zero to like something like a dollar in small increment. And in addition, the researcher also randomized where they put the tent where you would get your results. So in some cases, it was put right in the middle of the village. So very convenient, but uh, uh, very visible. So everybody would know that you're going there. In some places, it was put, because it was random, so it was like kind of throwing a dart on the village and saying, well, we are going to put it there. It was like in the middle of a field. So a little bit far away, and not very convenient, but much more discreet because no one would, go, would see you go there. And what they found is that, number one, people were extremely sensitive to the reward. So suggesting that 
it is not some deep psychological fear that we are making them worry to pick up their test because or whatever this fear was could be overcome by 10 cents. Now it could still be the social thing. So here, what do you think they found with the, the tent? Uh, where, do you think more people got the result when it was far away or when it was close by? First, what would we expect under both, and what would we expect under the social, under the social stigma story? Far away then. That far away tent would have been more popular. But in fact, what they found is exactly the opposite, that the far away tent was not popular at all. Nobody wanted to walk like more than a kilometer to get their test. And the close by test was very, what tent was very popular. And furthermore, they also found that the elasticity with respect to the, to the gift was uh, larger when the tent was, sorry, the elasticity with respect to distance was much smaller when there was a gift. So when there was a gift, people did walk a kilometer to get their, their uh, results, but when there was no gift, people were, uh, uh, were very sensitive to the distance. So those suggest that in this case in Malawi, anyway, neither the social distance, neither the social background, not the psychological uh, barrier were so big, and that if people didn't get their HIV result, it was more due to some form of procrastination or inertia or something like that. And that is something a little bit surprising because uh, antiretroviral are available in Malawi. So in principle, if you find out that you're positive, you can, you can do something. And if you find out that you're negative, then you can uh, you know, try and do s take some steps to, to remain that way. Ben. Yeah, so in this case, it shows that, so in the case of the HIV, it was not meant to be some amount of money. But exactly what this means is that it has to be that they value the small gains more than the, than the results of the exam, which is, and this is what is surprising, which is you have to think, why is that the case when it is something that it should be so helpful to you to know whether or not you're positive? Or with the lentils, it should be so helpful to you that your kid is immunized. Yeah, continue. So, so is it, does that mean that we should kind of reevaluate how we place weights on the patient level? So, you know, you're saying, well, the HIV test or the just the HIV test could potentially be more helpful because they can be cured or given to the medicine that will affect the PDD or process. So, you know, like, should we be assigning more weight to the short term, like, instant gratification that they can have or, like, assigning to the PDD? So what he's asking is, does it mean that we should, uh, we should put more weight on, the, on instant gratification things than we do? I, what this means, in my view, is that we should understand why there is this disconnect between what doctors know, for example, and what people feel. Yeah, because that's kind of the source of the mystery, that there is this big tension. And it has to be about the perception of the benefits. And one aspect of this is this future versus present. And one aspect of this is whether you understand what the benefits are. Yeah. <coughs> in Malawi, it's, and in several other African countries, it's actually available like, for free. So you, you can do something. You, it's, not, uh, it's, not going to, it, it's not going to cure you, but it's going to greatly improve your life for the, for the time to come. People might not fully realize that. Um, I have two questions. <coughs> How does the certainty of cost play? Because um, if you're getting a bed net today, that's a certain cost, but malaria is a huge cost, like <coughs> it's really uncertain. Um, and then my second question was about, with the lentil distribution, can you play with um, sort of short-term time in terms of cost? So people can procrastinate indefinitely if you always get a pack of lentils when you get a vaccine, but if you only get lentils on the first day of the month, then wouldn't that really lower the cost today relative to tomorrow? That's a very good, good, uh, good point. So wh yeah. why don't I t uh, table the questions until we kind of give a bit more context and we'll go back to exactly these questions there. So there really are two problems. One is that you might not know uh, that it's worthwhile doing, getting your HIV test because you might not know that you, you are entitled to the drugs or that the drug will really help you. 
And the second thing is, oh, you might not know that getting immunized is so beneficial. And the other is uh, uh, the, the benefits are in the future, the cost is now, and that leads people to procrastinate. So let's go over both, uh, let's go over both things. So the first thing is learning about healthcare. And we had a little bit of that discussion already last time. But uh, most diseases are self-limiting. Uh, that is, they just go away by themselves. So suppose, suppose that you start with the theory that, uh, so you don't know that, because you know, how would you know? You start with a theory that someone has told you that uh, as soon as you're sick, you should get a shot to put the medicine right into your blood. And if you don't do that, you won't get better. And then if the market is unregulated, uh, like it is in a lot of developing countries where anybody can establish themselves as a doctor, for example, we saw that in India, then you have a very strong demand for shots and someone is willing to supply it. You're never going to experiment away from the shots. So every time you can, you're going to, every time you're sick, you're going to get a shot and you're going to get better. And so you're going to think that your theory was once again vindicated. Because you were sick, you got a shot, now you got better. That is going to further reinforce your belief that this was a good theory and further make you very suspicious of uh, not getting a shot. Now, of course, if you experimented once of not getting a shot, you would see, oh, I have gotten better as well. Progressively, uh, your prior would move towards something closer to the truth, which is, let's say, 95% of the time you get better with a shot and 90% of the time you get better without the shot. <coughs> but if your beliefs were 95% of the time you get better with a shot and 10% you get without a shot, then mostly you're never going to experiment. You're never going to know. And you're continuing with this very strong belief. Now, with, so this is for self-limiting diseases. And now if you take a disease like uh, diabetes or uh, chest pains or something like that, that doesn't go away with a shot. When you go to a doctor and get a shot, it doesn't go away. So progressively your priors are going to be that everything is useless. At which point you might as well go to the BOPA. So which is why we see this kind of somewhat, or it might be why we see this paradoxical result of people spending a lot of money on diseases that would cure themselves anyway, and not doing really any attempt to treat seriously the diseases that they should treat seriously. Because the diseases that they should treat seriously are beyond uh, the ability of the Bengali doctor to handle, because first order, the Bengali doctor can handle nothing. Uh, so the Bengali doctor end up spending, you know, distributed these antibiotics for uh, diseases that fix themselves anyway. People don't get any form of treatment for things that they should really try and treat, which would be much more complicated to treat. And you get this like no learning equilibrium that is very difficult to get away from. Uh, now, and it will be harder to, to attribute to nothing. So the, the tendency to over medicate is a very, very strong uh, uh, tendency. And in fact, it is not something that this tendency to over medicate is not something that you only have in poor countries. In rich countries, when you go to the doctor and they tell you, you know, like when I arrived in the US, my first doctor visit was you should breathe under the shower. And I was like, what are you talking about? <laughs> like in my country, I would have gotten a, an antibiotic immediately. And uh, so our own tendency is always you, you must do something about me. You, like you, you should be able to do something, not just let it go. Uh, and the only reason why doctors don't do it here is because they are under guidelines and they have regulations from their hospital, from their association, from what they've learned to not do these things. Now, preventive care yeah. is even worse because with preventive care, you are taking an action today to prevent something to happen in the future, but far away in the future. So you, you try to, for example, you, you breastfeed your child so that the child doesn't get uh, uh, so that the child gets stronger in the future and doesn't get sick in the future, or I guess with breastfeeding it's also avoid diarrhea right to, uh, in the in the meantime. But for immunization, you get immunized and then you don't get measles at some point. So linking the two is really difficult. And I think Noam had made this point with respect to uh, with respect to deworming. It's even harder when you're immunized against a communicable diseases. Because even if you don't get immunized, and, or even if you do get immunized, and people around you don't get immunized, if there are enough of people who get immunized, then no one gets measles. 
So the fact that you got immunized protects other people around you as well. So what you're seeing is that, oh, the soul is this immunization thing. Now I got it. And now I, yes, it's true, my kid doesn't have measles, but no one does have measles. So clearly it is not because I got immunized that, didn't, that I didn't get it. Now, of course, it is because collectively there was immunization around, but it's very difficult to infer. So the, uh, if you remember, uh, the, the results of the deworming study, when people had more friends around them who got the deworming, they were actually less likely to get dewormed. And one possible explanation is that initially they were convinced by the people that deworming would make them, their kids less sick, but then they saw all of these kids around them who, doesn't, who, who don't get dewormed and don't get sick either, and so they're saying, what is the point? I don't need to do it. So this is very difficult to, so this is basically not something that we can learn ourselves. It's not something, that in a lot of our own lives, so if, for example, if you grow, if you try to grow a field and you do something, uh, like for example, plant in row instead of scatter plant, you see immediately that your plant is doing better. So you can progressively experiment with better techniques and you will get better at it. So in most of our lives, we experiment things and we kind of see the results, or at least we have a sense of what the results are and we can kind of adjust our behavior. With health, our, our, our own experience, our own observations is very misleading most of the time. We think we can infer from our actions something that we cannot really infer. It's not because of the medicine that we got better. We think we can infer from uh, from, the, from not seeing a result from immunization that really the immunization was not working, etc. So it is just not possible to learn because the object is too complicated. So how do we learn about health? The answer is we don't. I mean, you guys might because you've been forced to take biology so you have some sense of it. Uh, but most of us just don't have anything to do, uh, like have no, under, no real understanding of uh, why medicines are working unless we have sort of red stuff on the side. But still, when our doctor says you don't need an antibiotic to cure that, we trust them. We trust them because they've spent a lot of money and a lot of time getting a, getting a healthcare education. We believe that there is something into it. And that trust, same thing with immunization. We get immunized because we're told to get immunized and not because we understand how it works. Not at all. So it's got nothing to do with our education or our first superior intelligence. And in fact, this trust is quite fragile. Uh, and you see it uh, eroding reasonably easily uh, when something happens. So for example, uh, the, um, there has been a few well-publicized uh, uh, articles linking the uh, measles vaccine, which is MMR, uh, measles something, rubella, MMR vaccine, and autism. There's been some uh, court cases, etc., which have always been actually the people who uh, who were suing against the vaccine have, have, have generally lost. But despite the fact there is pretty much ingrained somewhere in the collective mentality the idea that in fact MMR vaccines might cause autism, and as a result there is much there there is kind of an epidemic of non-vaccination for measles, uh, which. Uh, uh, has led in some, in some places to measles outbreaks that you didn't used to have before. So these things kind of are actually reasonably fragile. Uh, if you're interested in that, there is a book by a New Yorker journali journalist called Michael Spector called uh, Denialism, which has a chapter, a very interesting chapter on this, on this vaccination in the US. And this vaccination in the US story reminded me of uh, vac polio vaccine in India. So polio vaccine is one thing that for some reason the government of India has decided that they were going to really do. So most kids do get the polio vaccine. But there are, there are pockets where it's not being done and they tend to be Muslim villages which are refusing the, uh, the polio drops. And the reason is that they, they say it's, it's an attempt to sterilize us. And why do they have this idea that might sound a little bit bizarre? It is because, or it is linked to the fact that in a uh, long time ago, during the emergency period, which is when Indira Gandhi suspended the civil liberty, there was a big drive to encourage uh, sterilization of people who had had at least two children. And this big drive took a shape that was sometimes 
quite unacceptable, in, including rounding up people who had no desire of being sterilized, including lying to people about what was being done to them, etc., etc. And this has created this huge mistrust, in particular in the Muslim population, about uh, uh, what government's trying to do to them under the guise of doing something good for them. And so there are regions where people will simply not accept uh, to be immunized. So this is an extreme, those are two extreme cases where people have a strong belief against. If you do that here, uh, in those regions, giving people lentils to immunize them will not work. In fact, it might be counterproductive because they might think that you're trying to fool them, like, that, like you did with the sterilization already. But more generally, uh, the fact that people are generally indifferent about, uh, about preventive care might be related to the fact that they don't think there is some grand conspiration, they just think you're bullshitting them like you always are. And that is, uh, uh, and once this trust is eroded, then it's very difficult to go back. Yep. So I, don't, like, um, I, I think in America, like, don't most people like figure out like all these things about vaccination and preventive care work? Is the reason because like, they have like a, a, a family care doctor who tells them, right? or like some figure of authority that you can trust that tells them that these things work? Because like most, I mean, I'm guessing most Americans don't know like how vaccines work. That's exactly right. right? I, so, so yeah. if you have like the same thing in India or in Africa, like, wouldn't that just like you know like figures of authority that have been mandated by some government agency or like some school that tells them that like they know about this stuff, telling them that wouldn't wouldn't that get rid of this? Stuff? That's exactly right. The question is who is this figure of authority? So in the U.S., except for you know ex examples like this autism in the U.S., where there was some idea of conspiracy theory where you know, big pharma is trying to make our children autistic and things like that. Except in, in those cases, we have a, a, a basic sense of trust. That if the doctor, if your doctor tells you to do something, you think like they must know what it is they're doing. You don't understand what is going on, uh, but you still trust them. And, but the problem with a place like, like India, for example, is whether these authority figures exist or whether they are interested in preventive care. So in India, this sterilization campaign that I was talking about had a very, very long-lasting damage of con convincing people that the government was quite liable to lie to them on any matter involving health. So people are quite suspicious, and if someone, if a nurse tells them you should get polio drops, they're thinking she's trying to do something else to me. She's trying to get me sterilized. So once the trust is eroded, how do you, you know, Someone who is mandated by the government is someone who, a priori, you should not believe. So here you would need, you know, th so that the government becomes the, a negative, not a positive. So you... Saying, you call it Dr. Griffey, the fact that he's been mandated by the government or like by something... Exactly, so that wouldn't work. So you need other authority figures once you've eroded it. And once you've eroded the trust, it takes a lot of time to rebuild it again. But you can have other authority figures. So in pockets, you know, you have, for example, in the movie, you remember there is an NG, there is a doctor from an NGO who is talking in, about the, the Bengali doctor sometimes being good, sometimes being bad, and about the kids with the long hair. So this doctor used to work in a, in an, in a small hospital run by a couple, of, a, a couple doctor. That NGO around in this area Everybody was immunized. Everybody was always going to them. Everybody was getting preventive care because they, are, they had established that trust. But the problem is, how do you establish the trust? Uh, you know, this, they, they, they were on a very small area. So the problem is, once you have given up, the, the government has a lot of power to reach a lot of people. But once they have misused it once or twice or three times, uh, you know, the temptation to use the trust that you have from the people to get them to do things that are not necessarily in their interest is very strong. And once you have done that, then it's difficult to get back. Yeah. Um, is there <coughs> a for, for example, I remember in the movie that we watched, uh, there are a lot of people who would choose to go to uh, the popa um, instead of going to the actual doctor. Um, is there an initiative where people would actually use those entities to actually uh, provide, you know, the, 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 uh, <coughs> the population with medicine. For yeah. Example, I know, uh, I know in Brazil, like, there's, you know, parts of it where 
for you know a lot of people who were dying with uh, diarrhea. Um, <clears throat> people you use like their their like this um, women that were supposed to be you know to uh, sort of help them somehow, and they were more like a, um, not really like a typical doctor, but they were more like a cultural thing, and they started <coughs> using those persons to like, <coughs> deliver, you know, the the. Um, ORS, yeah. the oral rehydration solution to actually help those, uh, you know, people who are dying. Yeah, so I think that's a great idea. I think it's been tried. The problem is that then you need to be able to control these people because if you um, they already have some authority and then you in, you give them some more authority and then you really are worried of what they start what they start to say. So you don't want to transform them into a collection of Bengali doctors that are going to give them, you know, if the Bopas start giving antibiotics, then you're in trouble. Right. No, so that's the, so that's, but I think, but your idea is exactly right, is that basically, how do you use, once you've shut down the traditional channels, which would be your family doctor that you trust, how do you reconstruct some measure of communication that comes from other channels? And this could be the Bopas, this could be television, that a lot of people watch, and uh, so one, uh, and you could try, and so they, in, in Brazil, actually, there was, it's not about health, but it's about uh, fertility. Uh, people were all watching the soap opera, and in the soap opera, the cool people have very few children. And there was a study that was being, that, that was done, looking at the penetration of the soap opera. It was on network TV, so it's not always available, but it became progressively available in parts of Brazil. So you can follow the fertility as it becomes available in the different parts of Brazil. And you observe two interesting things. One is that as it became available, people had fewer kids. And the second is those kids tended to be poor. Like the name of the soap opera <coughs> heroine, like the kids had started to have those names, which is like the other. So other things like that you could like uh, try and imbue. So you could kind of, uh, so I haven't seen like evaluations of trying to get health messages to go through television, but these are things that you could also try. So use those other channels. Um, in the last five minutes, I want to say something about the present and the future. That's something we are going to, to get back again, which is kind of elaborating, elaborating on the point you were making before. Another problem is that the preventive health costs are, are incurred today but the benefits are in the future, and furthermore, as you pointed out, in the uncertain future, like it is going to happen later. So even if you know that it prevents getting measles, you don't know whether you would really have gotten measles, and you don't know, and it's in the future sometime later. And it, tur it turns out, which you can easily verify from introspection, is that human beings, not only the poor, but the poor, the rich, everyone, tends to put much more weight on the present than in the entire future. So this is something different than your regular discounting that today is more important than tomorrow and tomorrow is more important day after tomorrow, etc. This is something that today is much, much more important than tomorrow. And then tomorrow and day after, tomorrow is a little bit more important than day after and day after a little bit more important than the following day, etc. But today is like, much, much more important compared to the entire future in what we're thinking about. So that's true for, for consumption. So you would like to save for your retirement, but not starting today, starting tomorrow. Uh, it's the same with time. Uh, I, I gave you like the flexibility of when you're doing the essays for this class, but I did warn you that in my experience, a lot of students will decide to do the five last essays because they think from today that it's the absolute optimal thing to do because now you're very busy, but of course at the end of the semester when all the projects are due and the exams too, you'll, be, you'll have much more time. So <laughs> this is something that, you know, we can, it doesn't take much to realize that there is this problem. And not only we have this problem, but we are not fully aware of it. Because if we were fully aware of it, you would write me an email and say, can I please commit to a schedule of of, of essays and that, 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 you know, and ask Laura or Melissa to enforce, to enforce them. We are not aware, we are not, we realize to some extent, but we, we overestimate that we, we're thinking that today the present is very important, but that tomorrow we will start being reasonable people again. 
and now tomorrow comes and tomorrow becomes today and again today is like so important and we can we 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 get fooled by ourselves like that repeatedly so with the immunization you can think this camp is available every month so you're thinking today i'm just so busy i can't go but i will go next month and then next month comes and then it's next month and next month is now today and you're so busy yet you can't go and that way you could procrastinate yeah Like I know, like if you if you said like people who turned in essays in like the first five would get like ten extra points, and then like then like the next five wouldn't get ten extra points. Like most people would do the first five essays. Just yeah. Like so you're exactly right. The, the intuition is exactly right, which is if we suffer from things like that, giving us incentive, small incentive to act today rather than tomorrow, uh, is uh, is will help. So for example, this idea of saying, if you're doing the first five, you're, going to, you're getting 10 extra points for the first five, that helps. And that is going to help this kind of, I could also have a disincentive, which is to say you get 10 negative points if you give them later. In principle, if you have some awareness of this problem, you should like this program. Because you should like the idea that of putting some incentive on yourself to act today rather than tomorrow. And so with preventive care, the problem is that in the developing world, the costs tend to be higher than for us. With immunization, like not only you have to go, but half of the time she's not there and all of that. So it's constructed exactly the other way, which is a small cost. Everything becomes a little bit more complicated. In our lives, everything is structured to make the small cost less costly and also to impose schedule on us. So for example, for immunization, you have a calendar that is given by the government that you have to follow. Otherwise, the kids can't go to school. But since kids have to be in school, you have to follow that. So it's a form of incentive, very strong incentive to make it compulsory. And the, the lentils is saying, well, there is a small cost of going. But in exchange of this small cost, you get a small benefit, which is the lentil. And so that can, uh, that can help people to, to go. And you're right that combining your two ideas, I could say, and you're going to get a bigger incentive if you follow the schedule than if you go at any point. In that way, that gives you a strong sense of doing it on, on time. So that is, um, so these procrastination issues could explain, combined with the fact that people have probably not a full understanding of the, of the benefits, could explain why uh, uh, we see this like huge waste because we really have to call this as a waste. All of these kids who are not immunized, kids who are not dewormed, kids who drink dirty water, and adults also. And that could come from this combination of n not fully understanding the benefits, not trusting what you are told, and this small and, uh, and the disproportionate importance of small cost. How can we solve it? Well, we can solve it by making things as easy as possible. This is what, ha what we benefit from. When you open the tap in your uh, water, there is chlorine that comes right. You don't have to remember to add the tablet. So making things automatic and defaulted. And when it's not possible, like we are very not a very well organized country like India, giving people small rewards that are offsetting the small cost, if possible, exactly in the way that you're talking about it, which is encouraging it peop the people to do it later rather than earlier. Uh, that means that charging a small amount for goods may be totally counterproductive, because you might lose a lot of people when you add your entire infrastructure to deliver the goods. And giving small incentives might actually be uh, productive. So <coughs> one, the last word would be, is it going to have some, and that's the question of the bed net that we spend a whole uh, lecture on, is it going to have some bad effect in the future if people are used to be helped in this way? And I think the answer is two-pronged. Second is these problems are here to stay. It's not that we have them today and it will be better in the future. We always have those problems. That's why immunization in the US is free and compulsory and it's going to be forever. We're not expecting that one day People will now understand the value and will, stop, will start doing it on their own. Secondly, is when we think about the dynamic effect, we also have to include learning. And because of the lack of trust and people just don't, just 
believe you because you said something. The fact of giving people an occasion to try for themselves by making things very easy and cheap may actually have those dynamic effects that are positive because of the learning, which is exactly what we saw with the bed net. So we don't need to go again, uh, to go through over it again, but with the bed net, these people probably were relatively suspicious about the effectiveness of those bed nets. You give them one for, and therefore not willing to pay the cost. You give them one for free and then they realize the benefits are bigger than the, what they were. And that can overcome the small cost to get the benefits in the future now that they are more convinced that those benefits actually exist. All right, so we are done with health and we are going to do, start with education next time.